Welcome. My name is Bill Brown, and I will be your presenter today. I am the Chemicals and Minerals Division Manager here at Hosokawa Micron Powder Systems. The subject of our presentation will be the micropolarizer, high-speed hammer and screen mill, and the new micro UMP mill series. The micropulverizer was the first mill developed by the Pulverizing Machinery Corporation to address the need for producing finer materials. When the first machines were developed back in the 1920s and 1930s, Hammer mills were machines that could only produce relatively coarse products. The development of the micropulverizer changed the industry and provided a method to produce much finer materials. Today, we will present some technical information that many of you may not have ever seen before, and we will also introduce the new micro UMP mill series. Lastly, we will discuss some systems designs and view photos of actual units. Pulverizing Machinery Corporation, the predecessor of Hosokawa Micron Powder Systems, was formed to manufacture a mechanical impact mill that could produce finer powders and could handle a wide variety of materials and their specific characteristics. What resulted was a unique mill that was simple in design, easy to operate, and easy to maintain. With the development of the first 10 horsepower, 12 inch diameter impact pulverizer, today known as the number two micropulverizer. The company went on to develop an entire series of mills. Based on the success of the micropulverizer, in 2008, Micron Powder Systems introduced the new micro UMP mill series. These mills were totally redesigned to showcase a completely new fabricated design with features allowing them to be widely considered for use in the pharmaceutical and food industries. In this portion of the webinar, we will review the basic design features, operating parameters, and capabilities of the micropulverizer. The micropulverizer product line consists of seven model sizes from three quarter horsepower and upwards to 250 horsepower. All models can be customized with a wide variety of components and materials of construction to meet most application requirements. The purpose of this presentation is to give you a better understanding of the operation of the mill and to introduce all the various options, operating parameters, and systems designs that are available for these types of mills. The micropulverizer can be used for pre-grinding, deagglomeration, and medium to fine size reduction applications, depending upon the design and operating parameters of the mill and the system. Micropulverizers will typically produce products having a particle top size of approximately 75 microns in prime. A wide range of particle size distributions with defined top sizes can be produced with the micropulverizer. Rotor speed, screen configuration, as well as the type of grinding elements provide for flexibility in producing many different end products. As an example, the combination of higher rotor speeds, smaller screen sizes, and grinding elements with the maximum surface area will lead to production of the finest end products. The util utilization of lower rotor speeds, larger screen sizes, and grinding elements with minimal surface area will produce the coarsest end products. With a properly designed and maintained micropulverizer milling system, it is possible to produce high quality in spec products on a continuous basis. This here is a photo of a number three micropulverizer. Here you can see the mill with the cover open and the rotor with hammers mounted in the main body. The micropulverizer works primarily on the principle of impact. These mills impart high impact energy upon a particle and will produce a sharp particle size distribution with a defined top size. This hammer mill design consists of a rotor assembly with hammers that rotate inside a cylindrical housing. The top of the housing contains a multiple deflector liner, shown here. Particles are accelerated into the liner by the impact force of the hammer. The impact breaks the particles in, into smaller pieces, and the liner slows their peripheral velocity and deflects them back into the path for further size reduction. 
The bottom portion of the housing contains a screen, shown here. The screen is used to control the size of the particles exiting the mill. Various screen types and hole sizes are used to change the final product size. Screens fit into a machine groove in the mill body, and on larger mills, cams are used to tighten and lock the screens into position. The rotor in this mill acts similar to a fan in that it will generate airflow. Shown on this slide is one of the two air inlets located on either side of the mill cover. These air inlets can be opened or closed to regulate the amount of air that will flow through the mill. Increased quantities of air can be used to reduce heat, help reduce material buildup, and keep screens from blinding. Most machines are provided with a feed screw mechanism designed to meet your material uniformly across the full face of the impact counters. Uniform feeding and even distribution of material is important to maximize horsepower utilization and capacity. Uniform feeding will also minimize the potential for overheating of the material and will reduce the potential for screen blinding. On smaller machines where material is gravity discharged from the mill, it will be necessary, necessary to adequately vent the mill in order to achieve proper operation. Venting can be done through the air relief port shown here on this diagram. This method of operation is only recommended for the smallest mills. The rotor assembly is supported in the main body by two bearing housings. These bearing housings are supplied as a standard with oil lubrication, and in severe duty applications, these bearing housings can also be equipped with recirculating oil lubricating systems for maximum performance and maximum life. Controlling particle size and particle size distribution can be accomplished by employing a variety of hammer and screen types. There are basically three types of hammers. The stirrup or LFS hammer, the swing bar hammer, or the rigid bar hammer. The stirrup hammer has the most surface area and is used at high speeds to produce the finest particle sizes. The swing bar hammer is used on materials that do not respond well to impact. Fibrous materials that need to be cut or shredded work well with these types of hammers. The rigid bar hammer is used for granular and coarse size reduction applications, and as well for producing narrower particle size distributions when a minimal amount of fines generation is desired. All of these hammer types have wear protected tipping, adding to a prolonged wear life. Tipping material can range from stellite to tungsten carbide. Tungsten carbide provides the longest wear life. Shown here, the photo to the right is a complete rotor assembly with a full set of LFS hammers. The hammers are held in place on the rotor by king pins, which fix the hammer position as well as the clearance to the liner and allows the hammers to swing freely and reach full extension under full operating speed conditions. Hammers are supplied in weighted sets and need to be completely installed to maintain the balance of the rotor, or correctly installed, that is, to maintain the balance of the rotor. The photo on the left here shows a 1 8 inch by 1 inch swing bar rotor. Rotor speed is another factor that will affect the fineness of the, of the particle size. The impact force imparted by the hammer to the particle varies directly with the hammer tip speed and therefore with the mill rotor speed. So a low rotor speed will result in a coarse grind. Conversely, a high rotor speed will result in a fine grind. The same impact force will be imparted on different size mills when the same hammer tip speed in feet per minute is employed. This means that a small mill will have to run at a substantially higher rotor speed than that of a larger mill in order to maintain the, sip, the same tip speed. The multiple deflector liner has grooves that are milled into the surface and are parallel to the face of the hammer. The liner's purpose is to slow the peripheral speed of the particles and also to deflect them back into the path of the hammers for maximum particle impact and grinding efficiency. It's important to maintain the specified clearance between the hammer tip and the liner as too large of a gap will reduce the performance of the mill by allowing the airflow to negatively influence the inward radial direction of the particle after it's deflected by the liner. To reduce the amount of fines generation, the ND liner can be replaced with a smooth liner. Hammerware 
Hammer wear can also adversely impact performance of the pulverizer. Hammers should be periodically checked for wear and replaced when wear becomes excessive and the mill performance declines. The function of the screen is to provide particle size or particle top size control. It's often asked why the material that passes through the screen is so small in comparison to the actual screen opening. Well, the explanation for this can be found in the sketches shown here on this particular slide. For example, A, in photo or image A, the material leaving the hammer has radial as well as a tangential velocity. The tangential velocity is always much greater than the radial velocity, resulting in the velocity vector OC shown here, which is also very close to the tangential velocity and magnitude in the path of the travel. A small particle which impacts the edge of a screen's hole above its center will pass through the screen as shown here in example B. Consequently, a larger particle which impacts the edge of the screen hole below its center will be deflected back into the grinding chamber as shown here in C. The main reason for the possibility of perhaps some oversized particles is due to the particle to particle impingement or deflection off the tip of the hammer radially through the screen. This phenomenon is shown here in D. There are three basic variations in the type of perforations used on the retaining screen. They include round perforations, herringbone slots, and cross slot perforations. In addition, the size of the perforations and the slots come in many dimensions. Of these, the round hole perforation is structurally the strongest and most recommended for the grinding of fibrous materials, as slot of perforations will allow an elongated fiber to pass through the screen slot. The round hole screen will also produce the finest grind, but does have one distinct disadvantage, in that it will plug or clog more quickly than slotted type screens. The herringbone screen consists of slotted holes on an angle. As an example, a 0 0.02 inch wide by one half inch long herringbone screen has the same opening repeated across the surface of the screen at an angle of 45 degrees. A particle approaching the opening approaches the hypotenuse of this equilateral triangle, if you will, with two equal sides being 0 0.02 inches and the hypotenuse being approximately 0 0.03 inches. Therefore, the particle passing through the screen will be sized approximately the same as a 0 0.03 inch round screen. Vice versa, a 0 0.03 inch round screen will be roughly the equivalent of a herringbone screen having two thirds of that size open. This general rule of thumb will be accurate, except that a round hole screen will produce a slightly finer product because the overall open area is a bit less than that of a round screen, on a round screen. And therefore, the product is retained in the grinding chamber for a little bit longer of a period. The slots of a cross slot screen are arranged across the screen and at right angles to the length of the screen. Therefore, the size of the opening presented to the particle is the same in a cross slot as it, as it would be for a round perforated screen. And therefore, for identical grinds, or identical grinds will be obtained when compared with a round perforated screen, or perhaps a little finer when compared to a herringbone screen. Shown here is a jump gap screen. In effect, it's not really a screen at all, but rather a series of overlapping bars arranged so that the particle approaching the bar approaches a ramp, and the slope of this ramp serves to, to deflect the particle up and away from the gap in the screen. If the particle is small enough and light enough, the airflow through the gap will change its direction of travel and carry it through the gap opening to the discharge of the mill. But if it's not, the particle will be retained in the mill for more grinding. This type of screen is ideal for abrasive materials requiring heavy duty service. The wearing edges of the jump gap bar can be wear protected, and the bar itself is, is considerably heavier in cross section than a standard steel, steel screen. The one drawback to a jump gap, jump gap screen is the potential for the coarse particles to pass through it. Regardless of the screen type, all screens have dust seals at either end, which seal the screen to the body and the cover, prohibiting oversized particles from bypassing the screen.
Here we look at the effect of an airflow on a passing particle through the screen. The airflow through the screen will have a very little effect on changing the fineness of the particle or increasing the capacity of the pulverizer. Let me explain the reason for this. This drawing shows a 0.039 inch round perforated screen hole with the particle passing over it at an average speed of approximately 19,000 feet per minute. This is about the average air to material velocity or air or material velocity within the pulverizer running at top rotor speed with the air inlets on the mill fully open. The velocity of the air through the screen hole though is based on the maximum airflow generated by the mill, which in this case is approximately 700 feet per minute. This is only about 4% of, of that tangential velocity of the particle passing over the screen. At 19,000 feet per minute, the particle will pass over the screen hole in one one thousandth of a second. Consequently, the low velocity of the air passing through the screen hole, working on the particle for such a short period of time, will not change the direction of the particle and cause it to pass through the screen. There are many options available for the micropulverizer, and several are listed on this in the following slide. You will see uh, pictures here of these options at the end of the presentation. There are many feed feeding options, but the most common is a volumetric screw feeder. The number of screws depends on the, upon the size of the mill. The SCB feed hopper was designed for use in the carbon black industry, in which large volumes of material are essentially air conveyed into the mill on a continuous basis. This feeding device can be used on all but the laboratory sized mills and can be used wherever, whenever light density or sticky materials are required to be fed to the micropulverizer. The W feed cover is used when larger feed materials need to be introduced into the mill. This feed option works well for large feed sizes in upwards of one to two inches or even perhaps slightly larger. It's intended to be used with softer feed materials or those materials that are brittle and easy to fracture. All micropulverizers that are designed for continuous operation are supplied with discharge hoppers attached to the outlet of the mill body. The air conveying discharge hopper is used when we want to convey material away from the mill discharge on a continuous basis. The conical discharge hopper is used when we want to gravity discharge from the mill directly into a bin or storage hopper or when we want to discharge material into a dense phase pneumatic conveying system. In either case, a rotary airlock would be supplied at the discharge of a hopper. An air inlet manifold can be attached to the mill housing cover at the air inlets so that both cover inlets can be isolated when conditioned or filtered air needs to be used as makeup, as makeup air for the application. For high temperature operating conditions, the micropulverizer can be supplied with water cooled pillow blocks. The benefit of water-cooled pillow blocks is prolonging the life of the balance. Shaft seals are also used to provide a positive seal between the rotating shaft and the mill cover and body. The photo in the upper right-hand corner of the slide shows a bearing housing with a shaft seal housing. The O-ring you see provides a seal to the mill body and cover. A cover seal can also be provided and consists of a grooved mill into the mill cover that accepts an O-ring that creates a positive seal between the cover and the main body. This option is used when the application requires that no air enter the mill or when the mill is operated under slight overpressure. We can also provide the micropulverizer in a non sparking design. That is, in this particular design, we use materials such as monel for the hammers and brass for the liner and screen, so that if there is contact between the components due to failure, no spark is generated. The photo of the rotor at the bottom right is that of an LFS rotor with vented rotor discs. You can see large holes in the rotor at 90 degree intervals. The vented rotor is used for better air distribution within the mill, which can assist in more uniform material intake when using an SCB or other air injection inlet arrangement. It could also provide or prevent material buildup within the rotor. Recirculating oil systems can also be supplied for severe duty applications when mills are required to run at high temperatures or run under very high loading for extended periods of time. Micropulverizers are often also used in cryogenic grinding applications, as it is quite easy to inject liquid nitrogen into the mill through the cover. These are five basic parameters of the micropulverizer that affect particle top size and overall particle size distribution. Process parameters include feeder speed and rotor speed. 
The major impact on particle size will be from the speed of the rotor, and maximum rotor speed will produce the maximum fineness. The other variables depend on the types of the comp components installed inside the mill, namely the hammer type, the screen type, and the liner type. By making changes in these components, as well as the process variables, we can affect not only the particle size, but the full particle size distribution. As an example, let's say we wanted a tighter particle size control. We would use a screen to control the particle top size, and then we could perhaps slow the rotor speed to reduce the amount of fines material generated. Hardness of the feed material is associated with mill component wear as well as life of the parts. As you can see from this chart, different mill types are suited for different material types and particle size requirements. In our discussion today of the micropulverizer, as well as the micro UMP, that we will focus our attention on the highlighted segments of the hammer mills and pin mills. These mills can process materials with the most hardness in upwards of approximately, or let's say less than 3.5, down to about 35 microns in particle size. Shown here are some examples of food products, as well as fine chemicals and minerals that are processed in the micropulverizer. From this list, you could see the variation in particle size that the micropulverizer is capable of producing. This reference table here for micropulverizers shows several important design parameters for the different mill sizes. Located next to the model names are the maximum rotor speeds, the relative capacities, and the relative capacities indicate the scale of factor regarding mill capacity. As an example, a number 4 TH with a 100 horsepower motor will have approximately five times the capacity of that of a number 2 DH. The other important information shown here is the approximate airflow generated by the mill, which will be needed for sizing air conveying systems. In this part of the presentation, I would like to introduce some technical information that will assist you in operating your micropolarizer. The topics presented will include material characteristics and their effect on performance, the most hardness index and its relation to wear life, scale up information, temperature rise calculations, estimating component wear life, adjustment of fineness and capacity of rotor speed, screen changes to adjust fineness, and finally, feed screws and gearboxes and their relation to capacity. Now, let's see how material characteristics can affect performance. Larger feed material means more residence time in the mill to achieve your desired particle size, and a larger mill would be required for a, for a given production capacity. Feed size affects feeding methods as well as feeder selection. Bulk density affects flowability of the product. Feeding can also be affected. Light density materials may flood past the feeder, affecting feeding accuracy. Heavy bulk density materials may be difficult to air convey to the mill. Cohesive and sticky products may build up on mill internals and may also upset airflow and increase pressure drop across the mill. Systems may require the use of high velocity air to keep mill internals clean, or perhaps low melt point materials are sensitive to mill systems with high energy input it may require cooling in order to efficiently process. Hydrostopic mill uh, materials absorb moisture, causing buildup and plugging. It may require dehumid dehumidified air for processing. On the other hand, products containing moisture may allow for high energy processing. The moisture in the product will absorb the heat of grinding, providing cooling in the process. Material harness may also need to be considered when selecting mill technology. Material harness may lead to high component wear and increased maintenance, minimizing the selection of equipment for abrasive applications. Special wear protection of mill components may need to be considered. On the other hand, there are friable materials or materials that fracture easily. High energy input could lead to excessive fines generation. The particle shape is important. Keep in mind that impact tends to produce sharper angular particles, and compression and shear forces tend to produce more rounded particles. Materials that are potentially ex explosion hazards do require special system designs. So you can see that material characteristics do play a very large role in machine selection and so on. Due to the use of a steel screen in the micropulverizer to control the top size, hardness in the materials to be processed are limited to a Mohs of approximately 3.5. For reference, the Mohs scale ranges are shown here from 1 to 10, with 10 being that of a, the hardness of a dime. Here is an example of how you would select the appropriately sized micropulverizer for a specific application. 
let's assume that you need to process about 4,000 pounds of material per hour at, a, a, let's say, a specific particle size to meet your daily production needs. Based on laboratory testing, we know that a 5 horsepower number one micropolarizer test unit produced 250 pounds of material in that one hour. 250 pounds per hour divided by 5 horsepower yields 50 pounds per horsepower per hour. Now, if we take that required production rate of 4,000 pounds per hour divided by the 50 pounds per horsepower per hour, we arrive at the required power for the production mill at 80 horsepower. So from slide 21, we can see that a number four micropulverizer is required to achieve that desired capacity. A micropulverizer will produce heat during the size reduction process. The temperature rise during grinding can be accurately calculated if we know the, the uh, mass flow rate of the material passing through the mill, the horsepower consumed in grinding the material, and the air volume passing through the, through the mill. The total temperature rise can be calculated by the formula shown here on this slide. In this calculation, we'll assume that all the mechanical energy in terms of horsepower input is turned into heat, and that all of the heat goes back, uh, goes into both the temperature rise of the material being processed, as well as the temperature rise of the air that is part of the air material mixture. But in actuality, some of this heat will be dissipated through physical surfaces of the mill. However, this value is relatively small and can be ignored, ignored for this purpose. For each horsepower per hour of energy that goes into grinding, 2,546 BTUs are liberated as heat. This figure is then multiplied by the total horsepower consumed. The result is a total heat input per hour during the size reduction operation. So perhaps as, as an example, let's illustrate just how the formula works here. Let's assume that we have a number two micropulverizer grind, grinding granulated cane sugar to a, uh, a 4x uh, spec, utilizing a, a 20 horsepower with a capacity of 2,400 pounds per hour, and the airflow is 200 cubic feet per minute. Substituting these factors into the formula will result in the calculation shown at the bottom of the slide here. So solving for this equation, we arrive at a temperature rise across the mill of 55 degrees. There is one point to remember, though, and this is that the air temperature may be less than that of, the, uh, that of room temperature, or the material temperature may, might be higher than that of room temperature. And in that case, the phrase TO minus TI, or temperature out minus temperature in, should be substituted for TO. Actually, TO is merely the temperature at the outlet of the mill, and TI is the temperature at the inlet of the mill. The inlet temperature may be different for the material being ground than that of the airstream. And in that event, this must be included in the formula in its proper place. TO or T out in such an instance will be the same for both the material and or the air going through the pulverizer. So as a guideline, the approximate air flows for the different size micropulverizers can be shown on slide number 21. Hammer, screen, and liner life of the micropulverizer can be estimated by running a five pound sample of the material on a small laboratory mic micropulverizer here in our test facility. This is an empirical test based on experience. The conclusion is that uh, any material tested in this mill under similar conditions would have a hammer life inversely proportional to the wear, to the wear on the retaining screen. So a five pound sample of material will be passed through the lab mill and the, and the uh, amount of wear would be measured. This number is what we refer to as the abrasive index. This abrasive index is then put into the formula shown to determine the hammer life. And from the hammer life, the screen and liner life may be estimated as indicated. This table here is partially shown, and this was developed from, from empirical data and indicates the general work performed by the rotor of the micropulverizer at a specific horsepower and mill configuration. Power input is proportional to the particle size reduction times the volume of the material handled. So as an example, you operate your number one micropulverizer at 7,000 RPM, producing a product with an average particle size of 100 microns at a production rate of 300 pounds per hour. Now, you desire a product with an average particle size of, say, 75 microns. Utilizing this chart and the reference multipliers, we can determine the rotor speed required to achieve the 75 microns product and the new capacity at that particle. Using the multiplier shown in the correct formulas, the new rotor speed would be 8,000 RPM, and the capacity would be 230 pounds per hour. 
please contact us if you'd like to make a change in particle size in your particular microfold brush by changing the rotor speed. We can also adjust particle size by changing the screen size and screen type, utilizing this chart in the formula shown. As an example, say we are operating a number two micropulverizer with a 0.027 inch herringbone screen that's highlighted here in yellow. And we are obtaining an average particle size of 150 microns. Let's say we want to now produce an average particle size of 45 microns. What would be the required screen size to use? Well, using the formula shown in the empirical data for the relative particle size, the resultant screen would be a 0.01 cross lot screen. The screen size and type would then be used to produce that 45 microphone ball. Please contact us if you'd like to help, if you'd like our help to change your particle size utilizing a different screen. In order to determine feed rates for the micropulverizer, we need to look at the appropriate gearbox and feed screw combinations. You can see here that different gear ratio gearboxes are available for different size mills. The range of screw speeds for each gearbox is shown opposite the gearbox type. These speeds will be important when we move to the next slide, as they will give an indication of the capacity range for each gearbox feed screw combination. As a note, all speeds are based upon 1,800 RPM input to the gearbox. Feed screws are screw conveyors used to convey the material from the feed hopper into the grinding chamber of the mill. They serve the important purpose of providing uniform feed rate, essential to a uniform and consistent finished product. This chart shows the maximum capacity in cubic feet per hour of the respective feed screw sizes when operating at 350 RPM based on a material bulk density of 50 pounds per cubic foot. For capacities at other speeds and other material bulk densities, please contact us. The type and size of feed screw recommended will depend entirely on the size and bulk density of the feed material. At times, it may be necessary to use the largest feed screws in combination with an open trough in order to handle large production rates. Now let's talk about the micro UMP. The micro UMP was conceived with the intention of extending the application range of the original micropulverizer. The main goal was to design a fabricated version of the original micropulverizer so that it so that its design and construction were acceptable, will be acceptable for the use in the pharmaceutical and food industries. The micro UMP is available in five model sizes that range from the small laboratory, laboratory scale, which is the LPM, to the UMP3, the largest production unit currently available. All models except the LPM are available with the original micropulverizer, LFS hammers, and screen configuration. Other grinding elements include pin discs for ultra-fine grinding at higher rotor speeds, and rigidized for granulation and coarse size reduction at lower speeds. What makes the micro UMP suitable for pharmaceutical food applications? Well, the most pronounced difference compared with the original micropulverizer is its overall design and appearance. We have also taken great care to design the mill for ease of access as well as cleaning. The micro UMP has a cantilevered bearing housing mounted on the rear of the mill body, so the drive shaft extends from the back side of the mill, leaving the front or door side of the mill available for direct access to the internal parts of the mill. The entire mill is fabricated in stainless steel and is provided with a 0.6 micron RA finish as a standard. Higher finishes are available upon request. The mill housing has reduced internal surface areas reduced connection points, and reduced acute internal surfaces for ease of cleaning. There are no through-body connections in the process area where leakage or contamination can occur. The bearing housing is designed with sealed for life bearings, and there are also double lips shaft seals with gas closing between the mechanical and the process areas to eliminate material contamination and, pre and premature wear of the drive components. Here we show three basic grinding options for the micro review on paper. The UMP with pin rotor and high-speed bearing housing will produce the finest overall product. However, due to the, to, uh, to the high impact speed, the overall particle size distribution will be very fine with a significant amount of ultrafines and a coarse tail. The UMP with an LFS rotor in conjunction with an MD liner and screen will produce a fine top size, but not quite as fine as the pin mill. But due to the lower rotor speed and retaining screen, a narrower particle size distribution can be achievable. 
And finally, the UMP with rigid right rotor, uh, rotor here is ideal for producing coarse, granular, and free-flowing materials. Two housing designs with different feed options are available for the micro UMP. Here, the center feed option shown on the left can be utilized with all three grinding elements and must be used when operating with pins. The top feed option is used for larger feed materials and also when higher capacity coarse grinding is required. The top feed option can only be used with hammers or knives. The pin disc assembly includes a stationary, or include, includes a stationary pin disc mounted to the inside of the door cover. A rotating pin disc is mounted to the main drive shaft of the mill. During rotation, the interlacing pins create a labyrinth for the product to pass through, providing ultra-fine size reduction. The pin rotors are designed as singular unitary discs with hydraulically pressed pins. The knife rotor is designed and manufactured as one piece. The rotor is designed to be reversible and is supplied with sharp edge applications that require more shear force and a flat edge for applications that require greater impact. This chart shows some of the uh, basic operating parameters of the five micro UMP models. Basic capacity scale up is done by horsepower, just like the micro pole rotor. In addition to horsepower, we also show maximum rotor speeds. For the hammer and screen option of the UMP, the top rotor speeds are identical to the rotor speeds of the equivalent size micropulverizer. When using pins, however, you will notice that the rotor speed is much higher. This high-speed rotor option allows you for very fine grinding in this particular type of mill. Shown here are examples of food, pharmaceutical, and fine chemical products that can be processed on the micro UMP with pins. This chart is similar to the one we show for the micro pulverizer. Because we have no screen or liner in the pin mill version of this machine, we have fewer variables that affect particle size. In the pin mill version of the UMP, there are three basic parameters that can be changed to manipulate the particle size. The parameters of feed rate, rotor speed, and airflow, and the effect they have on particle size are listed here. Increased rotor speed, reduced airflow, and low feed rates will produce the finest end products. The micropulverizer and the micro-UMP can be set up in several different system configurations. The smaller mills are designed for independent operation. Each of these small machines is provided with its own integrated feed, air relief, and product collection. The larger series of mills are designed to be part of an integrated system design for continuous production. These systems have independent feeding and product collection systems. Since both pin mills and hammer mills generate airflow, the air generated during the milling process has to be vented from the machine. The most basic and compact micropulverizer the UMP system operation is shown here on this slide. The mill and product collector are mounted on a hopper, and the materials processed in the mill and displaced in the displaced air and product mixture flows to that product collector. Particles entrained in the airstream are collected in the filter and discharged back, back into the hopper below. The finished product is gravity discharged from the hopper through a rotary airlock for final collection into a bulk container. The displaced air is vented through the product collector. If required, a fan can be used to pull a negative draft through the system. Negative pressure systems reduce or eliminate dusting to the atmosphere and result in a much cleaner operation. For continuous operation of the micropulverizer, material can be air conveyed away from the mill and collected into a downstream product collector, shown here. The valve you see located in the ductwork at the inlet of the conveying duct under the mill is used to regulate that amount of air pulled through the mill. This system design allows for additional product sizing by including a secondary classification step. Here, a high efficiency, high efficiency cyclone is effectively used to collect mill product coarser than 20 microns. The discharge of the cyclone is gravity fed to a screening device that permits secondary classification of the product into two fractions or we can use a screener to either de-dust or scalp the product. De-dusting is a process of removing a small percentage of fines from the product, while scalping is a process of removing a small percentage of oversized particles from the product. In this system, we have installed an inline dynamic air classifier. The mill product is directly conveyed to this classifier for separation at a specific cut point. The cut point of the classifier can be adjusted by varying the classifier wheel speed. The discharge of the classifier directs coarse product back to the inlet of the mill for additional size reduction. 
in this system design, we can classify at much higher or much finer cut points than we can with mechanical screening. The system shown here is identical to the micropulverizer system shown on slide 44, except that a micro UMP mill is now depicted. In order to have a better control over particle size and airflow through the mill, a secondary line is installed in the inlet ducting to divert a partial flow to the inlet of the mill. Automated flow control can be achieved by regulating these two valves shown on the air inlet lines. The system shown here is similar to the one shown in, on the previous slide. However, the design of, the, of this system allows for the recirculation of the process gas. There are reasons why a system designed like this would be used. One reason would be perhaps to recover expensive process gas that would otherwise, otherwise be lost on a once-through system. Our inert gas is used for applications involving products that can be explosive or explosion hazards. It can also be used to maintain product purity. The last system concept shown here uh, basically discusses or c combines milling and post blending. Many plant operations require the homogenization of batches after mill and prior to packaging. Here, the mill product is air conveyed directly to a blender for post mixing. In this system design, the mechanical components of the blender are designed to handle the negative system pressure. The advantage of this design is that less material handling equipment is needed, and the reduction is also a re reduction in the size of the dust collector to efficiently handle the dust loader and the overall space saving in the system layout. In this design, the product is completely contained in the system under negative pressure throughout the processing cycle, ensuring product purity and also a clean plant environment. Now I'd like to show you some photos of different machines that, that will allow you uh, to see some of the different designs and options that we've discussed throughout this presentation. I have selected various model sizes so that you will have an idea of the physical size of the different machines. Shown here is the LPM, which is the smallest mill in the micro UMP mill series. It was designed specifically for use in the pharmaceutical industry where very small quantities of material are typically available for test trials. The small diameter grinding elements in this mill can be operated at the same tip speeds as that of the production models, allowing customers to produce identical products but on a very small scale. Grinding elements include the options for pin discs or impact hammers. With this laboratory mill, quantities as small as perhaps 5 to 10 grams can be processed with greater than 95% collection efficiency. The LPM is equipped with its own vibratory feeder, product collection container with integrated vent filter, and onboard controls for varying feed rate and motor speed. The main rotor is gas purged to prevent contamination of the product and to protect, also protect the mechanical drive components. The sample mill shown here is the smallest mill in the micro pulverizer line. It is ideal for small sample evaluation. It is the most basic of the machines with only screen size and liner type as variables to produce different particle sizes. It is designed with its own manually operated feed screw to effectively meter material into the mill. The stamp steel rotor is a low cost and easy to change wear part. The mill discharges directly into its own one quart product container for 100% sample collection. The micro bantam or UMP B shown here are identical in physical size. The difference is the basic construction of the mill. The bantam with its cast housing has its cast housing and there's a, there's a limitation on surface finish, which make it suitable only for non-sanitary -san application. However, the UMPB is completely fabricated and is available with any product contact surface finish. The number one micro pulverizer and the micro UMP size one are the next size larger mills available. They are small enough to be operated as standalone units or they, they can uh, perhaps be incorporated into a small air conveying system. These are different views of a number two micropulverizer, showing a standard machine with a double feed screw arrangement on the left. On the right, however, is a photo of a micropulverizer with a, <coughs> excuse me, a magnetic separator mounted above the feed hopper to protect the mill from tramp material. The micro UMP2, shown here, is equipped with pins for producing the finest products possible on a mill of this type. The UMP2 has a center feed, which is required when using the mill with this pin, mill, pin configuration. You can see from this photo the clean lines and the flat surfaces on the internals of the grinding chamber, making it easy to clean and also to service. 
This is a view of a, of a 40 horsepower number three micro pulverizer from 316 stainless steel construction with LFS hammers and a triple horizontal feed screw arrangement. Here on the left is a number three micro pulverizer with a W cover used for gravity feeding of larger materials. On the right side is a number three micro pulverizer with an air inlet manifold mounted on the cover. If you remember our discussion from slide number 16, the, the uh, air inlet manifold is used for, for providing conditioned makeup air to the mall. These are photos which show a number four micro pulverizer and also a number 44 micro pulverizer. On the left is a mill supplied with direct air injection feed inlet, and the photo on the right is a unit supplied with a recirculating oil lubrication system. The number 44 micro pulverizer is the largest production model currently available. The number 44 is not available with feed screws and requires an independent feeding device. These machines are available with installed horsepowers of 150 to 200 horsepower. At 250 horsepower, it can process very high volumes of material and can be operated continuously in production environments. The model you see in these photos has the SCB feature. This concludes our presentation today in the micropulverizer and the micro UMP series. We will now start our question and answer forum. You can see the uh, dialog box on your screen, and you can submit questions or contact me directly after the webinar. However, if we, do, if we don't respond to your questions during the live forum, please note we will provide you with answers offline shortly. Okay, one question I see here, what material is used for the hammer and for the screens? Well, there, there are different types of materials that can be used. For example, with hammers, uh, most commonly we use a combination of steel or stainless steel. And we also have different tip, uh, tipping options for the, our LFS hammers for the medical pulverizer. Common tipping being stellite or, or perhaps even tungsten carbide or more abrasive material and applications. For the, uh, for the pin disc, for example, for the micro UMP series, they're typically uh, supplied in, in various types of stainless steel, 3 or 4 stainless steel, or perhaps 316 stainless steel. With respect to the screens, common materials will be uh, steel or stainless steel. Those are the most common. Uh, next question. Uh, please compare and contrast the micro polarizer to the micro ACM for a similar soft material. Well, for those of you that aren't aware of the micro-ACM, it's the uh, air classifying mill, which is a, uh, it's also a mechanical impact mill, but it utilizes an internal dynamic classifier instead of a, a static screen. So when comparing, or for that matter, contrast, uh, contrasting the, the, the micro-pulverizer to that of the ACM, the ACM typically produces a much finer particle size distribution because it utilizes that, that internal dynamic classifier. The uh, particle size range or capability of the micro ACM goes down to about 15 microns or even 10 microns, whereas with the micro pulverizer, we were talking in ranges of about 34 microns. Next question. Let's bear with us here as we read through the questions. One question I see here, how quickly can the rotor be removed for cleaning or inspection? What tools are needed? Well, it does depend on uh, which mill we're talking about. If it's for the micropulverizer, uh, for example, if we select the micropulverizer, typically we have pill, uh, pillow block arrangements or bearing, uh, bearing housings on either side. So in order to remove the rotor, uh, the feed inlet hopper needs to be removed or disconnected. And uh, in addition, in order to pull the rotor out, we also have to, in most cases, we use a belt drive configuration. So we have to remove the belts uh, from the driven side pulley. Once the belts are removed from the driven side pulley and the cover is removed, there are a series of bolts that hold the pillow box down on either side. Once those are, are, are loosened or removed, uh, the, the rotor can then be picked up and removed. However, for the pin disc assembly for the UMP, it's simply a matter of opening the cover and we have one bolt that holds the rotating disc, rotating pin disc. Next question. Can the micropulverizer style mill be one with liquid 
uh, liquid nitrogen. Uh, yes, uh, whether it's liquid nitrogen or another sort of uh, coolant, uh, the micropulverizer can be equipped. Uh, there, there are options or feed options where the cover can be equipped with a liquid nitrogen manifold such that it, it, we can inject liquid nitrogen into the cover of the mill in addition to pre embrittling the material as it passes through an auger, which, which is, it conveys the, uh, more or less the, uh, the uh, cooled material into the mill. Uh, one, one question I see here, for material with a Hegman, uh, Hegman of 7, which is below one micron particle size, it seems that the hammer mill and the ACM mills are not most recommended. Is that correct? Well, yes, that is correct. Uh, we, do, we do have applications where we're doing a deagglomeration uh, instead of a, a true size reduction or fracturing of the particle. In cases where we're doing a deagglomeration, it could be possible in certain cases uh, to a to reduce the size or deagglomerate the particles to a Hegman of seven, perhaps on the ACM, uh, but most likely not on the hammer and screen mill. Let's see, going to the questions here. The question I see here is specific to carbon black application. Uh, here we have a number four micropolarizer. Our main problem with them is that the bearings become internally dirty with carbon black contamination. Do you have a way to seal them? Well, one perhaps uh, one way, uh, one option we could consider, or you could consider, is having shaft and cover seals, in which uh, the uh, we would take the cover of the mill, machine a groove on there, as well as the main body. And equip the mill with uh, with, with O-rings or, or seals. In addition to that, we would machine grooves onto the uh, the cover and also the shaft, the rotor shaft, shown here or shown here, uh, to prevent material from leaking past that, that that gap between the stationary cover and body and the rotating shaft. By having shafts and cover seals, we do use that for many uh, carbon black applications with success. One question here, is it possible to measure the particle size in line? Yes, it is, par it is uh, possible to measure particle size in line. There are devices that can be used. There are different manufacturers that, that make uh, analytical devices to measure in line particle size. And we, uh, perhaps if you contact me or contact us offline by sending us an email, we could, we could talk further on that. Uh, final question, is it possible to move or displace the fine tail during, during milling? Well, during milling, uh, what we find uh, with, with the micropulverizer or micro-UMP, since it's a mechanical impact mill, uh, the nature of the particle size distribution is it will generate fines to a degree, no matter what we do to, uh, due to rotor configuration or to rotor speed. You will make a, uh, uh, an amount of fines, or you will generate fines. Uh, one thing would be to reduce the rotor speed as much as possible, uh, and then and then uh, changing your screen to to basically bring the top size back. But in cases where if that does shift to particle size distribution, and you do still tend to create that that particle size those those the fine distribution, then uh, perhaps uh, downstream classification or dejusting would be required. Uh, as I mentioned, that was our final question, so that if we did not respond to your questions during this live forum, we will provide answers offline in, in a short period of time. This concludes our presentation and question, question and answer forum. I hope you found the information presented today interesting and informative. I thank you for your participation, and if you have any questions, please contact us by phone or by email. As a reminder, this webinar has been recorded and will be posted to our website within 48 hours. Please consider sharing this program with your friends and colleagues. Thank you once again.